Hi, I'm Pastor Steve, filling in for Pastor Jake. Glad to be here this morning. We're doing our last uh, church in the seven church series in the book of Revelation. I'm so glad that um, Pastor Jake has been doing this. Um, it's so important that we uh, tackle the book of Revelation, that we endeavor to understand it and look at it. Um, today we're going to look at the church in Laodicea. It's the last of the seven churches, so get out your Bibles and turn to Revelation uh, chapter 3. And um, we're going to be looking at some interesting things today. At least I think they're interesting, so you have to listen to me talk about them. So I hope you find it interesting as well. Praise the Lord. What a great time of worship. Heavenly Father, thank you. Holy Spirit, your presence here is powerful, and we thank you for your presence here. Illumine our minds, enlighten us to the things we need to embrace. Father, if, if uh, we suffer from blindness of any kind, deafness of any kind, numbness or dullness of any kind in the spiritual realm, activate us this morning. Lord, we surrender to you. We thank you for those who led us in worship, led us into your presence. Lord, we felt like we were around your throne and joining with the angels and singing praise to you. Thank you that you accompany us through the week, that you strengthen us against discouragement of the world and temptations of the world and distractions of the world. Father, we know that you have something so much better in store for us, a powerful realm, a realm that's invisible, a realm that's powerful, a realm that's eternal. And so, Father, we just, um, we just yield ourselves to you. Father, as this word is shared, uh, uh, Holy Spirit, just pinpoint different things. There's going to be people in here, Lord, I know it always happens. People in here hear this thing or they hear that thing. They hear different things because you're working in our lives in so many different areas. So we surrender to that, Lord. I just speak your word and plead your blood, Lord Jesus, over what you want to accomplish in our lives today to nudge us forward, to strengthen us, to build us up. For these are end times, and we thank you for your part in our lives to prepare us for your soon uh, return, your coming, how powerful it'll be. So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we're encouraged to read and study and obey according to the words of his whole revelation, the word of God. But then this book of Revelation, the revelation that God gave to John on this island, this prison island, it was a, just a big rock. It was a prison island and he was put there because they couldn't shut him up. So they said, yeah, we'll put you there and and he had fellowship still with the church. He sent letters to them, and, and, um, and God visited him in a powerful supernatural way. He opened the veil from the invisible realm and showed him things that were to come, and it's so exciting. But you and I are, are um, Revelation 1.1 said that the purpose of this revelation, the purpose of this, this book, this letter, it says, is to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Show his servants the things that must soon take place. Now, how many of you know that God's soon is aggravating? So the soon is, you know, from here on, God, God, he's there and forever back and forever forward is all just laid out around him. I don't know how to explain that, so I won't try. But he, he has us set in time. He has us set in places. He has a, a birthday and then beyond for us. Nobody dies, do they? Nobody dies. They live forever. Everybody lives forever. You, you, and you make the choice of whether you're going to live forever in God's presence, in heaven, in eternity, or if you're going to have opportunity uh, to make this life hell and then extend it to an eternal hell somewhere else. And he offers up, this is his solution, he offers up the remedy of his son Jesus to be cleansed and to be set free. And then the battle begins. I mean, the, the beginning begins, but the battle begins too because nothing makes that stinking devil matter than when you say yes to Jesus and when you... When he comes and dwells in you and then he sets his forces against you and all the little 
booby traps he set in your life before you accepted him. He starts triggering those, and you say, wow, what is, why is that happening? Why is that happening? And this is the struggle we're in. This is the battle that we're in. And to the extent to which you surrender to him and pursue him is the extent to which you are strengthened in him in these days and times. And this, the extent to which you neglect that aspect of it, yes, you got saved, yes, you, you came into his family, but you don't, you know, just like a regular family, you don't just exist there, you don't just get carried along by everybody, you, you throw in, you participate, you strengthen yourself, and this is the success that you will have in these days that we live in right now, throwing in, uh, committing yourself, uh, uh, pursuing him, um, um, everything he has is available to you, and the more the more of God you get, isn't that God w- is holding back and will dole himself out to you. The more of God that you get is the clearing out and the lessening of the stuff that exists in your realm and your being in resistance to him. And in you know, some of you have been saved for a long time, longer than me. Not many of you. But, but some of you, and, and that, that process has been going on since the day you said yes to Jesus. So uh, um, 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 he wants us to see, he, uh, Revelation uh, says he, he wants to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. And so God extends blessing to those who study and endeavor to understand his revelation. Now, uh, when Pastor um, asked me to... Um, be in this series and preach this message on the on the uh, church to Laodicea. I was excited about that, but I th- things came to my remembrance of things that I'd learned over the years, um, and I I recalled a teaching that I heard many years ago, probably in the early years that I got saved, and um, it's an interesting teaching, and I'm just going to share this by way of introduction with you that. Somebody discovered, somebody as they were studying, looked at the seven churches and recognized something interesting. They recognized that each of these churches had uh, tendencies and traits of segments of time in church history. Now, um, um, I, I wouldn't, I, di- I don't take this, excuse me, I gotta put a cough drop in my mouth because it will lubricate my quickly moving mouth. So, and there's enough room. If we were closer, you'd get spit on. So you're safe. I can't spit farther than that. But it was revived in me this week. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to share that uh, with people. Um, this couldn't have been a, a teaching that was under, understood in any other way but prophetically to the early centuries of the churches. This was something that would have to have had some centuries go by. And so for somebody to look at that at it and then look back and see, oh, well, this, this was like this and this was like this. So let me identify each of these to you just by way of something interesting. There's aspects uh, of the churches and their situations and they tell an interesting story. And then John in this revelation, um, each of these churches contain aspect of historical identification. So first of all, the church at Ephesus. Now, I'm not going to tell you what's in the description of those churches, you're going to have to go and study. And if you're, all the women here can do this. You can listen to me and you can read these while I'm talking and you can get both of them. Men, you can't. So I just would encourage you to, to listen to me. And um, I always like that best, don't I, Deb, when, when you listen to me. And so the, fir- <laughs> the first is the church at Ephesus. And it's interesting, if you look at, at the description of the church at Ephesus, it describes the apostolic leadership, apostolic involvement. And this was described uh, by these, um, by these uh, uh, scholars to describe the history of the apostolic age of the church. There was an apostolic age of the church that went from basically the resurrection of Jesus Christ to A.D. 96. So roughly 100 years and so we'll, we'll call that and we'll identify that as the apostolic age, the age where the apostles were um, alive for much of that time and then those who were taught by the apostles. And so there was that more close connection 
to, to the reality of Jesus walking here on the earth. So there was that time. Then the church at Smyrna has elements within its description that describes the age and is identified by these scholars as the persecuted church. It was during this time that, um, during this time that under Roman persecution, that um, Christians were thrown to the lions and that they, they, um, they uh, Christians weren't persecuted because they worshiped um, Jesus or they worshiped God. That's not why they were persecuted. They were persecuted because they said that that was the only God you could worship. Because they were multi-God worshipers in Rome. And if you, um, if you worshiped Jesus but worshiped Caesar and worshiped the multiple gods, you were fine. But if you, like a Christian, said, no, there's only one God and Jesus is God, and then that's where you ran into trouble. And this was called the persecuted church. And the time span of this church was A.D. 98 to A.D. 312. So about 200 years of the persecuted church when, um, when, when it was very dangerous to be a Christian. And, but, but funny, not funny, but interestingly, um, under this persecution, the church it was like throwing fertilizer on the church. I guess you could make a correlation of that. Anyway, so the church grew and expanded and blew up in, um, under this persecution. And we see kind of the same thing in places in the world today, in China, the church, and different other places. But this age came to an abrupt halt in AD 312 when it began and was introduced to this next phase uh, uh, the church at Pergamos, and there's descriptions within that description of the church uh, at Pergamos in the letter from John to that church, where it describes the church of imperial favor. Now, why was it the church of imperial favor? It's because Constantine had, uh, the, the emperor had an experience with God and accepted Christ and accepted Christianity and proclaimed, went from the persecuted church to a proclamation that Christianity was now going to be the government-accepted religion. And so you have an abrupt shift from the persecuted church to the next one. And there's, again, descriptives within the description or letter uh, pointing out the church at Pergamos that would give, um, give the impression of that influence and that direction. So from AD 313 until 450, you had the church of imperial favor, a time span within there where, and it wasn't, Constantine was still kind of messed up uh, 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 in his leadership and in his rulership, but Christians got a reprieve from the focus of that um, persecution. So then next came uh, a, a transition from that church of Constantine, uh, a, a struggle and a, a transformation into the next phase of the age of the church that is described as the age of the papacy, the age of the pope and the popes and the Catholic church. And there was a transition from that imperial church to a church then where power was handed off to the popes and where they ran things and saw how things would go. And this was from A.D. 450 to 517, if you read um, uh, in the letter to the church of Thyatira, you see things there that would give you an indication of, they talk about works, they talk, I I know your works, and they talk about um, um, kind of a a proliferation of the, the, um, the obvious nature of the works, but that there were things that the Spirit of God still had against the church at Thyatira. And that went from 450 to 1517. 450 to 1517. And now we're getting into some familiar uh, present history because uh, in the description to the church at Sardis, this is the description or described as the age of reformation or the age of the reformation. And with that word, we can guess or we can imagine or if you're a student of history and you know that date that's the date that Martin Luther 
um, or in, in that in that close time period, because I'm not a great historian, um, nailed his 95 theses to the door. And so now you have a transition from the papacy to the Reformation. And, and the church in all of these phases and all of these uh, categories faced different trials, different situations, and different circumstances, and had different challenges that they faced to stay pure, to stay strong, to stay passionate about the Lord and keep their relationship fresh with God. So um, um, this, is, this is the church that began um, pretty much the age that began uh, in 1517 with, that, with Martin Luther. And so now you have Protestantism, and that goes along. And if you're a student of history, you know that throughout the world there's these little pockets of Holy Spirit activity. There's the, the, the mystics, the, the monks and the, and the um, monkesses, the boy monks and the girl monks. They, <laughs> what's the girl monk called? Nuns. nuns. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> there were none. And so they, they had, they had um, ecstatic experiences. These aren't words we use a lot generally, commonly today, ecstatic experiences but their experiences where God visited them in kind of a tangible way and they wrote and they described things and they kept, they were, they were, um, uh, they were given the responsibility to keep the truth of God active. But then pretty much through, through the world, even though the, um, the Roman Catholic um, abuses were pushed against and Protestantism uh, moved forward and there was... There was much bloodshed during that time, but there, that transition took place. Um, we had, uh, there, was, there was a strengthening of grace in the word and things going on, but not much eff- emphasis on the Holy Spirit or the manifestations of the, of the Holy Spirit or of apostolic leadership in the church, that which was described and explained in the New Testament of leadership wasn't really embraced and, and so... So then that went on to the next church that we see described, and that's the church at Philadelphia. Now this one, as I was reading these guys who found these traits and tendencies through each of these churches, I just, I kind of felt excited because this is the transition. Um, I mean, before I was born, before we were born, but not much before we were born, this is a transition that you and I... uh, um, um, this is a transition that a lot of you older people um, saw the end of the beginning of. Does that make sense? I mean, the, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the charismatic movement. And I'm not saying that the charismatic movement was the beginning. There was, begin, a little, there was some beginning before that. But we're seeing, oh yeah, this is, this is that transition from from the Reformation age to a new Holy Spirit revival age, to a new Holy Spirit outpouring age. And in my 60 years, yeah, 55 years of being saved and watching this happen and watching this unfold, I got to be a part of that, and you get to be a part of this right now. And so from, I'm not going to give it a beginning date because I, didn't do that much study into when um, the Moravians, you know, kind of were the more the beginning of that. But from there on, we see this this next stage and this next day. And not only that, but then you and I are getting to see that transition from that age, that outpouring refreshing, to the La- Laodicean age, to the age which the church at Laodicea faces and that I'll describe as the end time church, the end of days church. And so with that, I'll move out of my introduction and into the message, which will probably be shorter than the introduction. So um, this, this uh, uh, today's focus, these, this end of days lukewarm church, um, um, we, have a, we, have, we have, first of all, let me make this note. We have a contrasting picture today of the church. We have a contrasting picture where the church, there is a church that's lukewarm, 
but there is a church that is a remnant. And you are both here today. It's not like we're the remnant church and the church over there is the lukewarm church. No. Those believers who, who stay activated by yielding, by surrendering, I'll say those mostly and firstly, yielding and surrendering are the remnant church, are the active church and are on guard. And this is, uh, 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 but there is a great big fat lukewarm church today too. Those who are, aren't cold because they're warming, warming themselves by the fire of what's going on around them, but they're not jumping in. Now, that, uh, that, was, that, fra- that statement there wasn't in my notes, and I have to move totally away from that statement now in the explanation I'm going to give of something right here. In this uh, contrasting picture of the lukewarm church in Laodicea, in, in the warning to Laodicea, it's a warning to the believers of this day. Um, Matthew 24, 11 through 13 says this, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase in wickedness. Can I get an amen? Yes. Because of the increase of wickedness, this version says the love of most will grow cold. My New King James says, I think the love of many will grow cold. But this is a warning, and this is an identifier of the end time church. Jesus said, these are, and I've said this in a lot of my a lot of the sermons I preach because it's just a theme. Um, uh, will I find faith when I return? Jesus said. Will I find faith when I return? And what he's asking there is, will there be those active? Will there be those walking in the teachings that I taught, in the power that I poured out, in the life that I gave? Will there be those who do that? And evidence of, uh, evidences of those show up in your life, the battles you face during the week. How many of you say during the week, don't raise your hand, but just think about this. How many of you say during the week, man, oh man, I'm under attack this week. <clears throat> that's an awareness, that's an acknowledgement, that's an understanding of the battle, the invisible battle that's going on. A lot of times I'll be facing things and difficulties and there'll be like these heavinesses and these inklings and, uh, and I'll be going, oh, what's going on? And oh man, I'm having a bad day or oh, this or that. And then it, all of a sudden it'll dawn on me that, that the fight that we fight, the warfare that we battle against is an invisible fight. It's an, an invisible warfare. And if I realize that uh, uh, that's my cooperation with the Holy Spirit, then I can say, no, stop. In Jesus' name, stop. And I'm telling you, if you try that, I mean, if you already do that, you know that there's times where there's like an almost about face of the heaviness, about face of the chains, about face of the day that you're facing, and you face it with strength. And, and if, if you've not tried that, try that. You'll see that it's a reality. It's a reality. There is a real, tangible warfare going on for your faith, for your victory, for your life. And you need to engage yourself in that battle. But anyway, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The love of many will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And so this is what I'm linking arms with you this morning to do. Stand firm to the end. And not that you aren't saved, but that the final, eventual evidence of your salvation will be accomplished. Because when I got saved, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I got saved. Amen? And every day that I go out and live and do battle against the enemy, I get saved. Amen? And when I see him coming in the clouds and I rise up to meet him in the air, I get saved. Amen? So there's different saves. And so that's a will be saved. All right? So anyway, let's jump into this. Revelation 3, 15 and 16. Look at those verses with me here. He says, John says, or the Spirit of God says, I know your deeds. 
that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, I've heard it taught like this, not for a long time, but maybe you haven't heard anything different. So you're reading this and you say to yourself, by the way, if you're a novice in the Lord, if you're just getting new at reading the Bible and you run across this, Jesus is telling me that I need, ne either need to be on fire for God or totally against God. I either need to have a hot heart for God or just be totally cold toward him. That doesn't make sense. Write that down on a piece of paper. Write it down in your journal. And the next time you find a believer with gray hair, say to him, what does this mean? Hopefully he'll give you a good answer. Here's a good answer. All my hair isn't gray, but most is. He's talking about a situation around, around Laodicea. Laodicea was a city located in an area where there were a lot of earthquakes. And the place had been upheavaled and turned upside down cities and towns and everything else. And in Laodicea, there was not a good source of water. Water had been um, made scarce in Laodicea. It was the topography of the area. In fact, they had to bring water in via aqueduct, via transportation, pipes, whatever, aqueduct into the city. And so in Laodicea, the water that they had there was lukewarm. But in uh, Hierapolis, that was to the north of Laodicea, they had hot springs. <clears throat> and in that town, they were known for healing, these healing hot springs, these healing waters. And they would, they would transport hot water. I, I had read somewhere, I didn't read in this study, but I had read somewhere that they had actually built pipage to bring in hot water. But Anyway, to the north was this hot water that was healing waters, like a, a, a hot tub, healing bath kind of thing, if you like that kind of thing. So there's these healthy hot springs. And then to the south in Colossae, they had clean, cold, refreshing, cold water springs. So to the north, they had healing waters, and to the south, they had refreshing waters, but in Laodicea itself, the waters were lukewarm. And so the Spirit, or John by the Spirit, was speaking to them and saying, lukewarm water, everybody there knows. He's speaking to them about something they know. Lukewarm water. Who likes lukewarm water besides Deb out of her bottles on the counter? It's not healing. It's not refreshing. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You are not of use. You are not of good use. And so this is what he was telling them. The problem, uh, 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 the problem wasn't, I want you for me or against me. I mean, God's not like that. He doesn't need people against him. He wants everybody for him. It's his will that everyone be saved. So this was that hot water, cold water illustration for you to tuck away and to understand. But anyway, then he gets into describing the problem that they had in verse 17. It says, Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. Another thing about Laodicea is that they were offered by the government to come in, FEMA, I think it's called, to come in and rebuild and help them rebuild. But Laodiceans were wealthy. They were a rich city. They said, no, we can do it ourselves. We don't need your help. And so they rebuilt themselves, kept their lukewarm water. I don't know, maybe they piped it in north and south. But they were proud people. They were proud people. We can take care of ourselves, they said. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blinded, naked, the Spirit is speaking to them concerning their spiritual state. Now, I don't know about you, but the Spirit continually reveals to me where I'm getting lazy, where I'm getting, where I'm falling down, where I'm, where I'm stumbling, where I think, where I think, <laughs> here's the thing, 
you got a buttload of money, you're, you're, you're getting your dividends, you've got your four retirements or whatever, and then <clears throat> you're walking around like, like you own the world. I mean, <clears throat> the three of you who have that going on, and I'm talking to you. So, but what does it take for all that to collapse? I've got a great job. It's paying me buku bucks. I'm just going along, and I'm just doing great. What does it take for that to collapse? Let's say the finances don't collapse, and then you got a pain, and you go into the doctor, and they give you a diagnosis that you don't want to hear. All your cockiness, all your pride, all your I've got it all together can, can fall apart just like that. And I'm describing a life where you are trusting in yourself, your own strength, what you figured out. Uh, I hope you all know that the reason you have a job at all is because of the power and grace of God. The reason you have your strength at all. You know, the Word of God says he holds all things together. If he took his hand away, all things would fall apart. And so we aren't to be like the Laodiceans thinking, I've got it all together. It's all me. It's all mine. It's, 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 it's all that. I'm not preaching a gospel to put fear into you. I'm preaching a gospel that says, depend on the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. That's what I'm preaching to you today. That's where I go. Seek exclusively the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of that stuff I described will follow after you. Will follow after you. Don't seek those things. Seek him. And the word, it says, uh, 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 seek first. But that first means exclusively. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek the giver of life. And so we see this situation Um, uh, You say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. Um, So next verse, 318, he gives a solution. He says, I give you counsel, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. White clothes to wear so you can uh, cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are protected and shielded by God's power, until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold that perishes, even though it's refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. There is no one in here who can say it better than that. He's given to you, Father God has given to you through his son, a position and a place of relationship with him where you're provided for, supplied for, and moved forward in his plan and program. And it's more precious than gold. So he says, get this gold that's refined by fire. What is that gold? His relationship, his presence, his power. And we lean on that and not on our own understanding. What are the white garments that he talks about? He says white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameless nakedness. Romans 4, 7, and 8 said, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord doesn't count his sin. We are covered with white garments, and those white garments are, is, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you look at my rotund features, and in these 
features <coughs> is no righteousness. But he clothes me with his righteousness so that I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? You are the righteousness of God in Christ. So when the devil comes to you and says, you're a liar. When the devil comes to you and says, you can't do it. When the devil comes to you and says, you're a bad dad. When the devil comes to you and says, you're a bad mom. When the devil comes to you and says, you can't do it. When the devil comes to you and says all of those negative things that he says to you all the time, you just look him square in the face and say to him, I'm not, but he is. And I am clothed with his righteousness. And I am clothed with him. And he is disarmed. Why? Because the word of God says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he must flee. And so that's your power. That's your strength. That's your victory. There's stuff where we've got to We've got to agree with him and we've got to fight a fight and temptations we've got to say no to. But here's, here's, here's the, the um, secret of success. Don't give up. Don't give up. In that temptation, don't give up. In that thing you want to, want to uh, pursue of, of pureness, of holiness, of, of connectiveness to him, don't give up. Because here's the secret. If you don't give up, you won't lose. If you don't give up, you won't lose because he will never leave you or forsake you. If you don't give up, he'll be there. How many times will you have to ask him to forgive you? Seven times 70. How many times will you have to ask him for strength to go again? Again and again. But if you don't give up, you won't lose. And in that whole situation, you lean on him and you depend on him. So the white garments <clears throat> that I'm told to clothe myself with is his righteousness. And then he says, I salve for your eyes. Acts 28, 7 says, for this people's heart has grown dull and with their eyes they can barely see. With their ears, they excuse me, barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. And so he gives us salve. He gives us healing presence of himself to open my eyes that I can see, to open the understanding of my mind and heart. And I can understand. And I can perceive what he has for me. Yeah, you can play that music. That's awesome. And so there's verse 19, verse 18, that I may see. Verse 19 says, And as many as I love, I hug and kiss and hold close to me and only say nice things to. Right? Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke. And chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Therefore be zealous and repent. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. He's standing at the door and knocking. This is in the context of the letter to the Laodicean church. He says, you thought this, but this is this. Here's what I want to drive home. Here's what I want to impact you with. All of our victory is in him. All of our strength is in him. All of our, all of our overcoming is in him. It's not in us. What's in us is agreement. What's in us is cooperation. What's in us is to say yes and never give up. That's what's in us. So he says, those I love, I rebuke. Those I love, I chasten. Those I love, I correct. 
And so in the name of Jesus this morning, Lord, we receive your correction. Your correction for our sloth. Your correction for uh, 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 disobedience. Your correction for, for not coming to you and asking you for more. For strength, for power that is yours in us. Lord, we stand corrected. We stand corrected. I receive your correction this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, speak to hearts and lives here. Speak correction to hearts and lives. Correction to lean into you a little more. Correction to lay aside those weights that so easily beset us that the author of Hebrews talks about. We leave behind the weights. Correction. Lord, we receive your correction this morning.